not a factor emerging from a more fundamental reality, such as ajiva or matter. Quantum theory is also consistent with other important Jain ideas, such as Anekantavad and Syadvad, which teach that reality is multifaceted and that seemingly contrary attributes can occur together. For example, light as both wave and particle. For many, many centuries, adherents of other dashanas, other schools of thought, attacked Syadvada on the basis of the seemingly self-evident claim that the same entity cannot have contra contrary attributes. But quantum theory is showing that that's precisely the case at the most fundamental level of reality. In the spirit of Anikantavada, I want to assure everyone that my idea here is not that materialism has no validity. That would not be very Jain of me, right? Uh, all perspectives have some, some value. A large portion of our experience can indeed be explained purely through material and mechanistic forces. So materialism is perfectly fine for that purpose. And it's led to so much of the technology that we have. Uh, so I don't want to dismiss materialism, and I certainly don't want to downplay the importance of the findings of neuroscientists. They, they know far, far more about the brain than I do. But my point is that, again, in the spirit of Anikantavada, there's no single view that encompasses all of reality. This is a view that is appropriate to certain questions. But when it comes to things like ethics, when it comes to things like the meaning of life, it's not very helpful to us, materialism. Uh, it can tell us why we love our family in terms of brain chemistry, but it can't tell us what we should do about it, right? So we need other dimensions of reality. We need other views in addition to materialism to explain these things. Both quantum theory and giant thought demonstrate that all theories have a limited purview. Materialism is not, be, not able to explain all phenomena. Why then do so many neuroscientists cling to it uh, a very uncharitable view, uh, very hard-hitting, was given by uh, Marilyn Robinson in a recent issue of The Nation. She says, nothing can account for the reductionist tendencies among neuroscientists except a lack of rigor and consistency, a loyalty to conclusions that are prior to evidence, that's an important point, and argument, and an indifference to science as a whole. I think she's a little harsh. Uh, again, that's not very Syadvadi uh, thing to say about the poor materialists. But uh, the point here is that the totality of science, science as a whole, has indeed gone beyond materialism of the conventional kind. And in the words of Jim Tucker, the rebirth researcher that I mentioned earlier, what most mainstream scientists seem unaware of, or at most only vaguely aware of, is that the most fundamental findings of physics have now disproven materialism. So, science has in some ways gone beyond materialism, but it's still very, very widely held. And this includes among people who decide to give research grants and so forth. So there's a bias against this idea of reincarnation. Why is there so little research into the question of rebirth? Uh, my good friend Jonathan Edelman and his colleague William Burnett did an excellent study on this in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. They say that one reason parapsychological studies on reincarnation in particular may often be considered outside the pale of solid academic research is that reincarnation entails an ontology that is a worldview uh, that deeply contradicts contemporary scientific, philosophical, and Christian theological views of mind <laughs> consciousness. If it were shown that a human mind or consciousness could reincarnate into another body after death, this would have a revolutionary impact on how we understand mind-body relationships, the nature of human memory, and the ontology of consciousness, as with the studies done on near-death experiences. Moreover, reincarnation would rule out reductive materialism and give some credibility to non-physical views of consciousness in Eastern religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. And of course, that's why we're interested in it here today. It fits very well with Jainism, this avenue of research. I'm aware that I don't want to go over my time, so I'm going to go through the next bit a little bit quickly. Uh, there are two types of alleged past life memory. Uh, hypnotic, that is evoked usually in adults under hypnosis, and spontaneous, typically coming from children. So uh, in, under hypnotic regression, patients are regressed to their past lives. The most famous book on this is by Brian Weiss, who really stumbled upon this by accident uh, while putting a patient under hypnosis. But subsequent uh, attempts at past life regression have not been very helpful from a scientific perspective. It's so easy to have people generate fantastic stories using leading questions, the power of suggestion, and even implanting false memories. This became a big legal issue in the United States when many children were 
uh, prompted under hypnosis to give false allegations of child abuse about adults and uh, uh, led to a lot of problems. The other avenue, though, is a little more promising, spontaneous. Dr. Jim Tucker of the University of Virginia and his predecessor, Dr. Ian Stevenson, have collected hundreds of cases of children who appear to remember data from other people's lifetimes. This is a picture of Stevenson. Stevenson's body of work is impressive, but it has received criticism. And my sense is that Tucker has since made the methodology more rigorous. What were the problems with Stevenson's research? First of all, I have an enormous respect for him. He was a pioneer in a field that many people said was not promising. Uh, there were some difficulties. Uh, again, as with hypnosis, leading questions. Children want to please adults. So they will tell you what they think you want to hear very often. And this uh, makes it difficult for children to be witnesses in court, but also to talk about past life memory. Difficulty ensuring the children had not been exposed to the information previously. Maybe they're legitimately telling something they think happened, but it's something they saw or read or heard. And cultural assumptions. Being India, I suspect there are many people in this room who have firsthand experience with children, or maybe you were one yourself, who had past life memory. But from a scientific perspective, cases from a culture where the belief in rebirth is widespread are not valid, because people are assuming it's already true and it can shape the nature of the questions. The really compelling ones are the ones like Ryan, where you just don't expect this kind of information to be coming out. Which brings us back to his case. Uh, he addresses many of these issues. His parents rejected the idea of rebirth. They weren't asking him leading questions. They thought he was possessed. They thought he was crazy. Information in his memories was not widely available. Marty Martin was not a famous person whom you could look up on the internet. He is now because of Ryan. OK, I need to finish. Uh, but uh, he, he, his memories, as I said before, actually corrected Martin's death record. Even if such cases are not repeatable or testable under the most rigorous standards of science, how do we explain him? How do we explain him? Which I'll come to my conclusion, you know, how does a young boy carry detailed factual information in his mind about a man with whom he has no normal connection? What this suggests at the very minimum is that this is an avenue of research worth exploring, that an extremely interesting phenomenon has emerged that can't simply be dismissed. Thank you all very much. We observe somebody and immediately we experience emotions and all that. How that is done, we don't know. Is universe maya or illusion or is from coming from quantum vacuum, it's real or virtual or holographic? And then the two things which were mentioned is biocentrism, that is everything is produced from, uh, from uh, uh, the self or the atman or the consciousness or materialism that even everything is produced by uh, material, material or matter rather than everything is made out of parmanu, even including consciousness. So it's very, very easy to define what are the important uh, questions. Any of these answers takes us closer to the truth. And why it is important is not because uh, by knowing them uh, we understand things, but their answers can change our life. If we know for sure there is rebirth, if we know that everything came out of consciousness, if we know that how the universe is made, then our lifestyle will change. We'll all become good people, I'm sure. <laughs> so can the truth be known? This is the second question. I mean, what is truth is one question, and can we know it? And do the humans have the capability? So I, I'm going to discuss here what Jainism says about it and what science says about it. So let me at the outset tell you that science always gives answer in yes and no. It is a binary system. But Jainism is a non-absolutist system. It never says yes or no. It, for everything I, I'm showing here, the question is, is it a bird or is it a fish? Okay? So according to Jainism, there will be seven answers to this. It is a fish, it is a bird, it can be both, it can be neither, or it is indescribable, and like so on. It, we should not take Jainism to mean that there is confusion. It, that is how the nature is. It is not that we don't understand but the nature itself is like that. 
that it does not manifest in yes and no kind of thing. So I'll try to answer these things. Uh, so the whole universe consists of three things. One is the self, who knows, that is how we define the, 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 the self, the knower. The, the other is the object, the universe, and the third is the knowledge. And there is a continuous interaction going between all these three. Now, Darwin had told that evolution of a person depends on this interaction, but it is the other way also. So this is continuously going on in the universe. Actually, the whole universe is a, is a play of the interaction between self and matter. So that is how we understand it. Now, I've been working on this problem for a long time, and I find a lot of parallelism between science and Jainism. So I'm not going to discuss this, but I just listed that there is some reason to believe that a lot, lot of concepts in science and a lot of concepts in Jainism are same. One is the causality, what we call in physics, is same as karma vad. Uh, determinism is another thing. You can determine everything given the initial state of a system. Uh, all its future can be defined. And uh, we have a uh, word called Kram Baddha Paryay, is exactly like that. Then we have entanglement in physics, which uh, is very well defined by this Jain uh, uh, icon, Parasparopa Graho Jivanam. All matter is interlinked. Not only interlinked, not only interdependent, not only, but also uh, it is uh, entangled. That means you can't take them out of this web of the world. And the law, law of conservation, which is very, very common in physics and chemistry, and this we have defined, these uh, Jain Agams knew about it in the very beginning. That is why they came to the thing that you can't create something out of something else, and everything is eternal. So because of the similarity, I am encouraged to look into this question. Now there is a fundamental difference between uh, science and Jain philosophy. Science believes that there is something known and something unknown. And more you study, the unknown will be converted into known, and one day we'll know everything. Jainism does not agree with it. It says there is known, and there is unknown, and there is something which is unknowable by, not totally unknowable, but unknowable by sensory organs. It is not, it cannot be known, OK? Now, I'll give you examples about this. But this unknowable can be known by certain other techniques. And that is where Jainism comes in. Now, the problem with sensory organs is the following. They are not perfect. I study the brain. When I study the brain, I learn more about brain. Then my brain becomes better. And then I can study it better. And so this loop continues. So the point I want to make is, that sensory organs and mind are always learning and updating. When I come into this hall, I am a different person. When I go out, I have learned something, I am a different person. It, this is a perennial per process. And it is, can never be perfect. That is what Jainism says. So it can never give the correct, complete, or perfect worldview. And what is scientific study? What are the instruments? That is just an extension of sensory organs. It is not something independent, OK, I have a telescope, I can see further, but it's still the process is the same. So uh, let me come to this thing. I listed here all these possibilities about origin, materialistic view, biocentric view, it has been talked about. Then uh, this duality, that is a Purush and Prakriti and so on. And Jain view is that Parmanu and Atma are eternal. Parmanu aggregated and gave rise to material universe, and Atma combined with matter, that is Karmanus, and give rise to different species. So these are some basic framework within which these are some possibilities, some options available to us, and we have to discuss the origins in this respect. Now, about Jainism, I'll discuss Jainism and science, both one after the other. 
The sad word is there, first of all. What does it say? It says no proposition is complete or fully correct. <laughs> so anyway, there, is a, there are some principles, and uh, there are some uh, principles in science. Uh, and I, I can take uh, uh, Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty. And then there is another uh, important uh, um, quantum mechanical concept that Schrodinger's wave. From atom to the universe, everything is a wave, can be described by a wave equation. And there is Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which says uh, nothing can be uh, complete in a sense. Then there is a, you see, Einstein taught us many things, but one of them is that nothing can travel with a velocity faster than light. So supposing I want to know how big is the universe, I can only know how much light has traveled in the age of the universe. And age of the universe is 14 billion years. So 14 billion multiplied by the velocity of light is as far as I can see. I cannot even see beyond it. So there is an inherent uncertainty in my observation. I cannot overrule it. I cannot violate these principles. You will hear this uh, lecture by Penrose uh, about consciousness, and it has already been talked about. But if you compare the concepts of science and Jainism, we have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is similar to Syadwad. We have complementarity, which is same as perspectivism. That means with what perspective you are seeing and so on and so forth. So we have these uh, very similarities. I'll conclude by saying that science says that consciousness is an emerging property, a byproduct of brain during information processing. It is a process. That is what all uh, physicists who are working on this believe. Actually, it is not a process. It is a separate, independent existence. That is what Jainism says. And it makes decision out of many options by a quantum mechanical process. And I think details have been worked out, very good mathematics and all that, and uh, uh, brain um, um, structures and uh, cytoskeletons and uh, microtubules, all these have been considered. But they, they are at variance with the Jainism, which says it is a dravya. It, it uses brain as a tool. It is not produced by tool. The consciousness is pro not produced by tool. It, it is a... Uh, it, is, it uses the brain as a tool. Uh, it can explain, the Jain model can explain uh, how experience is created out of observation and so on. If you believe there is a consciousness field spread over the universe, and uh, uh, it can explain anticipation, clairvoyance, telepathy, uh, and uh, there are some other serious problems. So how do we 